I'll now introduce uh, our first keynote speaker, Kevin Erickson. Uh, okay. So Kevin is the um, Austin B. Fletcher Professor of Law at Boston University, where he leads the Social Innovation on Drug Resistance Program. Uh, he is the founding executive director and principal investigator of Combating Antibiotic Resistant Bacteria Biopharmaceutical Accelerator, also known as CARB-X, which is a global nonprofit uh, funded by the US, UK, and German governments, uh, Wellcome Trust, and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundations. Its mission is to accelerate a diverse portfolio of innovative antibacterial products towards clinical development and regulatory approval. Um, it, uh, Carbex has been awarded a huge amount of money, um, over initially over 800 million, but I understand just renewed with even more um, uh, to um, help accelerate all of this work. So we think that this will be a, a wonderful introduction to thinking about um, the issues of AMR, how we approach them, uh, and the challenges really trying to bring the broad view uh, of AMR to this meeting. So Kevin, really grateful that you were able to join us and looking forward to your talk. Thank you. <clears throat> you know what you must be thinking, uh, a lawyer um, at, at a genomics of AMR conference, somebody made a mistake, right? But uh, you know, I hope uh, if you give me a little patience that we'll be able to get to the end of the talk and you'll see how some of this might be relevant to what we're doing here today. I've got my handy thing. All right. You know, bacterial threats uh, to human health are, are amazing. They, they thrive in all sorts of uh, ecological niches, including social ecologies. Think of uh, social ecologies as things like, like cities, or, or poverty, or war, or displacement camps, or healthcare settings like an ICU, or long-term care facility, or intensive agriculture, right? Um, all these uh, solutions, when we think about them, we need to broaden from just an individualistic patient focus to think about these social settings. We also need to consider the fact that eradication of bacteria is not our primary goal in most settings. Uh, we need to live sustainably over long periods of time, you know, generations uh, with bacteria. And so our tools, and especially the legal tools and, and social tools that we use, I think also needs to recognize this context in these settings. So this is, um, this is uh, my city, and uh, you know, you know of, uh, of the, the newer Cambridge as a, as a center of, of global you know, innovation, also the older Cambridge from which we take our name. Um, but you know, cities are amazing. You know, cities uh, and, the, and the world that we live in today, you can think of it as uh, an immense privilege to even be alive today compared to the rest of human history. Um, there's a lot of human freedom, a lot of human opportunities, but also you know, tremendous inequality in the world. Uh, lots of settings in which uh, all the things that we t take as a privilege are, are not found. Instead, we have poverty and disease, oppression and, and difficulties. And so a lot remains to be done. And whatever we have succeeded in doing against infectious diseases is very unevenly distributed around the world. So dying today from a bacterial infection is a marker of two things, uh, either poverty or extreme age distribution. This is uh, my granddaughter, seven years ago. Uh, she had a serious bacterial infection at birth. She was successfully treated at Boston Children's Hospital. And uh, for most families across human history, uh, this ends in tragedy. Uh, for my granddaughter, it didn't. But I recognize the fact that not only for history, you know, this is a, a tombstone, uh, for history, did this end in tragedy, but for most of the families of the world, it ends in tragedy today. Most people around the world don't have the same access to the facilities and to the, to the ability to treat infectious disease like we enjoyed uh, for my granddaughter. There's uh, 1.3, 13.7 million deaths today uh, from infection, associated with infection, from the Graham Report and Lancet. 7.7 .7 million of those are from bacteria, okay? It's about one in seven of all deaths associated with bacterial infection. If you look at this map, which maps the, uh, the deaths from, from the morbidity from bacterial infection, you might also think that it's mapping poverty, right? They're very similar in those ways. Out of the 7.7 uh, .7 million deaths from bacterial infection, 1.27 million of them can be thought of as primarily caused 
by a drug-resistant bacterial infection. But even that smaller subset of drug-resistant bacterial infection, the mortality is greater than the mortality that we see for HIV AIDS or for malaria, malaria okay? And yet, we don't have the same global structures uh, to respond to this, to this group of diseases, drug-resistant bacterial infections or bacterial infections more broadly as we do for HIV, AIDS, and malaria. Antibiotics <clears throat> enable, there we go, enable much of what we call modern medicine. Um, you know, both uh, you know, in, in high-income settings and low-income settings, whatever we have that, uh, that you know, modern medicine has brought to that setting, antibiotics acts as a safety net. And here you see some examples. I could have added actually 10 or 15 other columns. Just about everything that you can think of. Antibiotics, or put it the other way, if we lost the effectiveness of antibiotics, many medical procedures would become more dangerous or more costly, higher risk, less cost effective, right? It's not gonna go away automatically, but it makes it less effective uh, over time. Just think about you know, cancer drugs, and here's some cancer drugs, uh, or, uh, or pain medicines. I didn't take any Advil today, but, uh, but if I had, that, that Advil I took, could have taken today, is just as effective as the one that I took 10 years ago. Right? And the fact that I took an Advil 10 years ago doesn't impact the effectiveness of, of Advil or pain medicines or, or other things going into the future. Most medicines are gonna work on human biology, antipsychotics or statins, the drugs are gonna last forever. For infectious diseases, different story, right? These drugs decline with effectiveness through use. Uh, we call that in economics rivalry, and, and for you it would be resistance or, or just evolutionary biology. And the antibiotic that you take actually can threaten my health. In the language of economics, that'd be negative externality. What you do actually pollutes the effectiveness of the drugs for me. It also reduces the effectiveness for future generations. Negative externality. These two conditions, rivalry and the negative externality, really change everything. Not just the biology, but really the understanding of how economics and law works in this setting, including my work on how we should pay for antibacterial innovation, antibacterial r &V. So I hope at least in the introduction you get a sense of why a lawyer is talking to you today. The only person in the room, I think, with a tie on. <laughs> Maybe I should take it off. I'll get more cred with you. Um, so my project is to map the legal and social ecologies of resistance so that we can understand the human and the social complexity of AMR, and we can use legal tools rooted in economics and incentives in order to live sustainably with the microbial world. And my vision is to drive the deaths, at 7.7 .7 million uh, deaths from bacterial infection, drive that towards zero. My work at CARBEX, which I'll talk about a little bit, is to, is to develop and support therapeutics, prevention, and diagnos diagnostics uh, from early stage projects that have barely left university and in some settings have not yet left university and take them to the end of the first in human clinical trials so that the world will have better tools in the future. My research work identifies legal, economic, and social barriers so that we can get that stuff out of the way and let clinicians and public health people do what they do best. That's my goal. So let's start first uh, with microbiology or, or with this audience, genomics. I, you know, I, I should have had a, a picture of, a, of, a, of DNA here. So what's growing in your Petri dish is kind of the question you know, for, for this picture. But also if we zoom out a bit and, and think of you know, if that was microbiology, this is macrobiology or just ecology. You know, what, what are the settings in which the species, thousands or millions of species, are interacting with each other in an ecological setting? And then and there's, there's a reference. And then laying it on top of that, we can also think about people, right? And here are cities, but all of human habitation, all of the human impact on the planet, the way that we share and spread, um, you know, bacteria amongst each other. And so there's a lot of interesting papers in this regard as well. I think of the social microbiome paper from January 24 in Cell from Mamar Sekhar and, and, and their colleagues at, at Harvard, uh, and many others talking about the way that society, people interact with, uh, with microbes you know, in positive and negative ways. But then also we can zoom out to every living thing on Earth, right? And you could call this uh, the One Health perspective, right? Thinking about um, you know, how this works, uh, another, frame, another group of literature uses the phrase holobiome, 
And if you're as old as I am, you also may remember the, the Gaia paradigm or the Gaia hypothesis. Really similar things. How does this inter interact and work together on a planetary scale? So let me um, talk about the research agenda that, that I think is valuable, or a research agenda that's valuable for AMR. This is not something I've come up with. Uh, a lot of researchers are doing this work in, in many different settings and many different disciplines. I'm just trying to give it some, some shape and some articulation to you today. So first, an emphasis on ecological balance, something that's sustainable for generation, not necessarily eradication. Now, as we came to understand uh, you know, the role of microbes in disease, uh, there was a, an initial response of sterilization, right? Let, let's, let's kill the things, and so we'll have a sterile field. Still makes sense in the context of surgery, and, and certainly we want, uh, we want that in terms of water, clean water and, and clean uh, medical conditions uh, are, are wonderful, so don't get me wrong on that. But um, there's a lot of places and a lot of contexts in which commensal and symbiotic microbial communities actually are meaningful and helpful. Right? And we want them to thrive in their ecological niches. Okay? For example, um, I like bread and wine and beer and cheese, right? and, uh, and many other examples that aren't quite so, so food-based as well. If there's any primary care physicians in the room, you, know, you, you've, you may have had a, a situation in which a, a sick child is there, maybe with an earache or something, or, or, or throat infection of some sort, and uh, you, you don't have a diagnostic test ready, but you suspect it might be viral, you don't know it's bacterial, but the parent is really asking for something. Uh, have you ever been pressured? You know, I ask clinicians into this sort of setting, whether they've given into it or not, or whether they admit to being giving into it or not, they, they feel that pressure. What, what we don't understand or, or haven't communicated well enough is that the parent thinks that they're just playing it safe by getting the antibiotic and giving it to the child. If they understood how the antibiotic may well perturb the microbiome, uh, you know, wipe out the, the intestinal gut flora for the child uh, and to a harmful effect, then they, they might pause, right? If we overdo that communication, they might overreact you know, to that information. But uh, you know, parents don't currently, patients don't currently understand, I think, appropriately the negative internality, not externality. It's not me taking an antibiotic and harming you. It's me taking an antibiotic that harms me. We don't necessarily understand that well. Now, I don't have to say much about microbiome to this audience. I think just last month, you held a, an entire conference on the microbiome uh, you know, with, with, uh, and its impact on health and disease and, and whatnot. So there's, there's a lot of interesting things going on in this field. And uh, basically boiling down to the fact that throughout our history as a species, we have co-evolved with bacteria. Maybe that co-evolution has some symbiotic and commensal relationships that we want to retain. Maybe we want to understand some of those relationships before we wipe them out. So Carbex, the, the nonprofit that I lead, the research group I lead, has supported uh, a number of microbiome uh, antibacterial projects. One of the companies that we supported uh, had a later product that, which is now in the market. Uh, I believe, I'm looking at Richard Almer, chief scientist, I, I believe it's still the, the only FDA approved uh, microbiome product in the world, or in the United States, is that right? Valst, yeah, yeah. Um, that's actually gone through the whole FDA approval process. But um, that first microbiome treatment, Valst, uh, sold about $10 million worth of uh, drug product in the fourth quarter of last year to about 2,000 patients across the entire United States. Okay? So we need amazing science, but we also need to think about the social and legal context of things like reimbursement. Because if it doesn't get paid well, the companies are punished by the market instead of rewarded for the market for having a first-in-class, first-in-concept drug to the market. You would think it would be worth a billion dollars. It is not, okay? So my thought is that we collectively, and I doubt there's much argument about this here, we don't seek the absence of microbial life, but a sustainable ecological balance alongside and inside humanity. That might not be controversial here, but for people who design legal and economic models, uh, it was a new idea a couple of years ago, right? Things need to leak across even to the lawyers. Now, some of you might protest that, okay, it's one thing to say that commensal bacteria in the gut, you know, E. coli, okay, maybe that should be retained. But uh, there are bacteria and, and pathogens that deserve to be wiped out, right? And you could name several, cholera, right? 
or, or tuberculosis. You know, th there's, there's things in which uh, smallpox, right? Let's get rid of it, right? All the way, not just uh, down to two freezers, you know, but all the way gone. Perhaps we could agree on these, but you know, the world's uh, public health authorities, and starting with the WHO, but also the CDC and others, have come up with lists of other bacteria. You can think of these like the WHO most wanted or most hated bacteria list. And, uh, and several of you in the room, including Richard, have worked on, on the, reiteration, the, the new iteration of this list. But um, just think about that list. And, and there's a bacteria that's on that list, um, and, and really not just that specific species, but you know, multiple species, uh, Klebsiella, okay? Klebsiella pneumonia. And it's one of the great killers of babies in the world. And you can see some of the data here. So my question to you, if, if you had a little button that you could push, push the red button, and wipe out all club species from the earth, would you push that button? Okay. Maybe it's easy to push that button for smallpox or cholera. Would you push it for club? So I want you just to, to pause for a second before you act, because it turns out that a closely related species, uh, Klebsiella vericola, uh, closely related to, to club pneumoniae, um, actually has some important impact in the world. It's now, um, after years of work by various agricultural researchers, there's now a product for sale in the market uh, based using this bacteria, which uh, is planted into the soil, either with the seed or in the furrow, uh, which uh, is a nitrogen-fixing bacteria supplement. It's a, it's a way to, for, the, uh, for the farmer to get additional nitrogen into the soil without the application of synthetic fertilizers based on ammonia. Okay? The data shows that this product increases uh, yield of corn, and it's also used in multiple other crops at this point, mainly row crops, uh, by about five bushels per acre. And, and I haven't translated that into, into European language, uh, but it's a significant increase in productivity. Right? It's, it's not a marginal, it's not a small thing, it's, it's really pretty, pretty solid. So maybe we don't hit that button yet, uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria increasing crop yields without doing the climate damage of a fossil fuel based synthetic fertilizer, most of which runs off into the ecosystem and causes all sorts of other downstream effects. Maybe there's something else we want to think about here. My point here is just that ecology is complex and understanding it, and especially lawyers trying to understand it, induces humility <laughs> which is a, a rare thing in law schools. I, I don't know if it's a rare thing at the Sanger I don't, maybe, I don't know. So returning to the research agenda, the second major point is population health. Um, not just individuals, but one health in, in the broadest sense, not just individuals, but also society. So this is the, um, you know, one of the great innovations in public health. Obviously, when Jon Snow uh, realized that, that people were dying of cholera, and instead of treating the individual patients, not great treatments at the time, uh, he removed the pump handle, and uh, I'm told this is not the original pump, uh, but that, that somebody put up a replica of the pump uh, near the original location. You can go look at it. The pump handle is gone, though, so it's an appropriate replica. And, uh, and being British, they named the pub after it to, to attract traffic from public health people. So, uh, you know, for public health folks, this is your local pub, I guess. But uh, when you think about it, you know, this, this was a turning point in thinking about population level interventions, and it's a valuable thing. Now, I'm going to talk about different ways the social sciences uh, can speak into the problems that I've described. And, and I know that this is a, a largely a bench science sort of audience, but uh, I want to promote an ecumenical you know, level of thought as, as we talk across disciplines today. So four approaches to the, to the antibiotics problem rooted in law, economics, infrastructure, and equity. Now, I could easily have added uh, history and talked by, about Scott Podolsky's work uh, at Harvard and, and all the historians that are digging up plague graves and, and doing genetic sequencing of that. Or I could have talked about anthropology, you know, Claire Chandler's work here in, in England and in London and all of her colleagues on the Antimicrobials and Society uh, project. Uh, I could have talked about political science, you know, uh, S Stephen Hoffman's work at York and all the people that, that he works with. I, I could even give a, a spiel on, on how film and, and film studies, uh, you know, helps uh, or could be relevant in, in this field. But I'm not going to talk about all those things. I'm going to just talk about these four, okay? Law, economics, infrastructure, and equity. All right, 
So antibiotics is a problem of legal design. Now, two decades ago, I started working on bacterial infections as a problem in legal design. And, uh, and if you can believe it, uh, you know, this chart represents, you know, like a decade of my life, which is, you know, classic, right? Um, we all have situations like this. And uh, what I've done here is to, the columns are goals. You know, so the first column there on conservation, you could also think of that as being demand or stewardship, right? Same idea. Are we going to conserve? Are we going to reduce demand? Are we going to be careful with the drugs? The second column is the production function. So are we going to create new drugs? Or is this the innovation idea you know, in this column? Let's increase the supply of antibiotics is really what this column is about. And then the rows are legal interventions that one could imagine. And I'm not going to go through them all, but you know, all the, the, the eight boxes here. But property law, regulation, contract, and tort. Now I have to say that before I started writing this area two decades ago, probably 95% of the legal literature was in two of these eight boxes. Um, and really most of it in that property production box, it was all about intellectual property patents and using patents to incentivize uh, production of, of drugs and, and even specifically for antimicrobials. And then some of it uh, on the utilization of, uh, of regulation uh, to, uh, to constrain demand, you know, stewardship and, and, and that sort of thing. But most of the work was in those areas. And so I broadened the field to really focus on contract. And these are tools like, let's think about how we reimburse for antibiotics. Uh, let's consider prizes. Let's consider subscription models, which now England and, and soon the United Kingdom um, has a fully functional subscription program for antibiotics. Uh, revenue guarantees, like what's being considered both in, uh, in the European Union as well as in Canada. Uh, these sorts of things um, are contractual ways to both take care of the, uh, the innovation piece as well as the demand conservation stewardship piece simultaneously. Uh, they're trying to change the way that we pay for antibiotic innovation, and they do it in a way that supports conservation or good stewardship simultaneously. Another way of thinking about this is paying for long-term social value. And really, the health technology assessment folks at NICE have had a major role in moving that literature forward in the past five years. So one example of, of a, you know, just to give you a little bit of an example into this, in the intellectual property for conservation box, there was a, an article uh, written by Eric Cades, at that point at William & Mary Law School, that, uh, that really just uh, piqued my interest in, in, in this field and got me writing, mainly because I disagreed with him and wanted to you know, show how wrong he was, right? This is what attracts law professors. They want to fight. They want an argument. Um, and, and so off, off I went. And his idea was that maybe the problem with, with conservation, with, uh, with antibiotics developing resistance too quickly, maybe the problem is in legal design. Maybe the patent is too short. Uh, if the patent is uh, 20 years, what incentive does a company have to try to make it last 30 or 50 years? Because the patent's going to run out. And most of the times, by the, by the moment the drug is actually approved, this 14 or 15 years of the patent left, uh, they don't have a long-term property interest in protecting the public domain of, uh, you know, Eric Cade said. And so maybe what we need in the first draft of his paper, a perpetual patent, and then in, in the final version, just a much longer patent. And, and with the long-term property right in hand, maybe the companies would make better decisions, okay? So, um, you know, I went after that um, based on, on really my growing understanding of the complexity of the biology of this area. Because I, I understood that his argument rested on the assumption that a company could actually protect a single drug through its own efforts and that other people's actions wouldn't negatively impact that drug. Put another way, uh, could a owner of a drug patent protect it, an antibiotic drug patent, protect it against the negative externalities from other folks acting in the ecosystem? And based on the evidence of both inter-class and cross-class resistance, I said, actually, probably not. And what you would have to do because of resistance within a class, like fluoroquinolones, or resistance across classes, you would actually have to give this perpetual patent to one company for the entire field because there's so much cross-resistance, or at least in every place that you could show uh, cross-resistance across classes. And, uh, and that was enough to, to, to put that particular idea to rest. But let me give you a more, a more recent example. The examples I had given in that paper were obviously 
15 years ago. Um, there's a company that is uh, working to approve Alorafem. It's F2G based in the north of England in, in Manchester. They worked on this new antifungal for more than 20 years, right? They've screened uh, hundreds of thousands of compounds. They've spent decades at it. Um, by 2014, they found a leading candidate um, it, it began to be tested in humans. They filed patents again in, in 2015, and then disclosed the structure of the drug in, in PNAS and Proceedings National Academy of Science uh, the year following. And then eight years after that, they finally completed a lot of clinical studies. They've, they've been to the FDA and back again. They might get approved in, two, in 24 or 25, okay? Drug development is, is slow and hard, <laughs> and a lot of people fail along the way. But still, let's just uh, assume that Alorafem gets to approval. It's a first-in-class antifungal at a time in which we have increasing concerns about antifungal resistance. And it's more than 20 years in development. But um, even if they've been given a 100-year patent or a 1,000-year patent, um, FTG would not be able to protect it from other people driving resistance to their drug. Because fungal infection is a problem in humans, it's also a problem, a significant problem in agriculture. And there's a lot of fungicides that are applied in agriculture. And uh, agriculture is also looking for new antifungal agents. And after years of work, a new fungicide was approved by the FDA, uh, not the FDA, the EPA in the United States in 2021, epiflufenoquine. Epiflufenoquine. So lawyers, we can pronounce Latin, but not so well on some of your words. Now, recent data in December of 23 in Nature Microbiology shows that this new fungicide actually triggers resistance to lorifem because they share a mechanism of action. You can't patent a mechanism of action. Um, it's a negative externality. One of the chemicals that somebody is using is damaging something else that somebody else has. Now, Alorafem, F2G, has the patent on both the human and animal use of their drug, and they were intending to never use it in animals. But that's not enough, because they weren't able to patent everything that goes after that mechanism of action. So my basic point here is that intellectual property theory, what the lawyers do in designing patents and incentives, has to understand and respect the science. And if we don't, we can make fundamental errors that means that the work that you work on for decades actually can't get to the market or gets to the market and fails because we didn't think of something involving evolutionary biochemistry, right? So I also want to note a one health failure here. When the EPA looked at this drug, the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, uh, they performed a robust scientific assessment. And they concluded, I'm going to read from the, the quote from the conclusion, the ecological risk assessment showed there were no risks of, of concern for any tested, non-target, non-listed organism, including birds, honeybees, and terrestrial plants. Okay. What they didn't consider was the fact that it might undermine the effectiveness of an important, almost ready to be approved antifungal drug, and therefore impact human health. It just wasn't in their radar to even consider such a thing. So that's a one health failure, that regulator, regulators weren't even considering uh, what the potential damage to lorifem from this new antifungal. All right. Now, I'm a law professor. I literally could go on for hours about law, OK? But I'm not. I'm going to move on to economics. Um, and uh, instead of telling you five or 10 more stories, because I want to give you a, a taste of that literature as well. Um, economics, and we're going to start with the idea, or really focus on the idea, that uh, antibiotics are a common pool resource. Okay, so common pool resources, you can think of these as a, as a shared fishery, right, or, or a common source of drinking water, something like that. It's a descriptive model. It helps us to think about new ways to manage this problem. The problem of innovation, which is also supply, or the problem of conservation, which is also demand reduction. Okay, And so you can see here uh, the common pool in different ways that we can regulate it. I mean, one regulation would be, you know, going back to science in 1968, give the property right to one person. One person controls the whole pond, and they're going to run it through property. Or maybe there's regulation, or, or maybe there's informal coordination, right? Eleanor Ostrom's work. But there, there's different ways for us to regulate or to, or to manage, strike the word regulate, manage this common pool resource effectively. 
Now, thinking about it as a common pool resource, you know, specifically for antibiotics, and maybe you can read these, I hope you can, but uh, this is from Center of Global Development, a paper that Anthony McDonald uh, put out recently. Um, you know, think about the production function. You know, the, the, the demand for antibiotics is not keeping up. The pipeline is not sufficient. And you can see different ideas here of, of why. Um, some of the failures because, you know, it's a common pool resource that's rivalrous. When somebody uses it, they damage it for future people. Uh, but also, it's not excludable. You can't keep other people from using it very easily, especially once the drug is generic. Right? So those two characteristics make it difficult uh, in the first instance to, to solve the, the pipeline problem. Um, the social and private values are, are, are wildly different. The private value, you can think of uh, what is the market willing to pay for new antibiotic? And the answer is almost nothing for new antibiotics. Cancer drugs, huge payments for you know, relatively short extensions of, of disease, uh, for, you know, progression-free survival or whatnot. In, in antibiotics, a, a new drug that actually saves a life from a drug-resistant bacteria, you know, you'll be lucky uh, to price that at you know, $1,000 per course of treatment. Uh, you know, just the pricing is completely different. Whereas the social value of antibiotics, from, from multiple studies at this point, what does society get on having effective antibiotics? It's in the trillions of dollars. The private value, much, much, much smaller. So that disconnect makes it difficult uh, for us to manage this, this common pool resource. Uh, the market also fails to provide access. You know, most of the people dying today from bacterial infection are dying, apparently, based on the data we have, from a susceptible infection. Uh, really, an infection for which a generic antibiotic today would solve it. So access is actually a huge problem, maybe the biggest problem, in addition to the problem of, of innovation. And the market is failing to provide that. And, and actually, the things that we've done and the things that we continue to do as society are actually making these things worse. And the funding for the pipeline is also inadequate. We've published a lot of this work at CarbX. It's really the reason why CarbX exists, right? Nobody is actually in charge of this pipeline. I mean, what would happen to an oil pipeline or to a railway network or something if, if nobody was actually in charge of maintaining it? Well, over time, you know, it would degrade in its usefulness and function. Who is in charge of this pipeline? Well, for the preclinical to phase one, I guess we are. But, uh, but a lot of other people in, in other parts, there's no coordination mechanism at this point. Thinking about the other side, the, the, you know, the, the demand side. You know, what are we doing on conservation? What are we doing on stewardship and demand? Also the same sort of problems, and there's excess demand. You know, public health itself is underfunded. You can think, what is the most impactful thing that we could do to reduce the use of antibiotics? Clean water, sanitation, right? You know, th that would be washed. That would be tremendously impactful, completely underfunded, not a market good, okay? I've talked about inequality. We, we know that it's a marker in this area. It's a driver of everything. Uh, the negative externalities that I've talked about um, previously, and uh, just the withdrawals are not coordinated. So th this would be like a, a fishing pond in which nobody is restocking it or making sure that the water flowing into it is safe and, and, and clean, and nobody is tracking how many fish we all take out. That is the global common pool of antibiotic effectiveness Probably the most effective and powerful drug class in human history, nobody's managing it. And it's a common pool resource problem of the first order. Now, what evidence do I have that we have a collapse? Um, you, you would see this if you had rising rates of resistance, high global mortality, especially in poorer areas, inadequate access, which I think is clearly shown, uh, underfunding of prevention, uh, lack of new drug innovation, multiple WHO reports, uh, investment actually falling, uh, companies having economic failures, and most researchers leaving the field have got some data on this. So this is a, a, a short paper that a postdoc and myself did a Nature Reviews Drug Discovery. Uh, these are antibiotic uh, revenues um, on the world, global antibiotic revenues. And the red are the branded, okay? So these are on patent. The green are the off patent generic. And these are revenues, not scripts. If it was the number of uh, prescriptions the green would always have greatly exceeded. Okay, but these are revenues. Okay. As recently as uh, 2001, you know, we had slightly more than $20 billion, and these are inflation-adjusted numbers, of revenues in the, in the branded market. And those revenues are used then 
you know, they, they incentivize the innovation for the next generation of products. And you can see what's happened since 2001. Now, if you drew a line across, you know, you know, let's go back to 2001 levels of antibiotic innovation. Some of you are old enough to remember that wasn't exactly a perfect year, but, uh, but let's pretend we're there. <clears throat> this is what's missing. $13 billion a year has been sucked out of the market, out of the innovation market. And if you accumulate this across, it's $150 billion which is missing. If you take any other drug class and suck out $150 billion, you're going to see failures in innovation. You're going to see an effect. We've seen the effect in antibiotics uh, for sure. These are the uh, small uh, pu you know, publicly traded companies that either have an FDA-approved antibiotic or have something that's close to approval in phase three. Um, this is it. Okay? And this is the, the fruit of uh, nearly a decade of innovation uh, you know, from all the small companies. The small companies predominate. Uh, in, in a more healthy drug sector, these small companies would have been bought by a bigger company in, in phase two or something, or in licensed, and, and the product would be you know, globally distributed by one of the global companies. But instead, because the market is broken, all that money being sucked out from the previous slide, these companies actually went to market with their sole product. Okay? So what's happened to these companies? Now, I, I want to say, first of all, these are the successful companies. Right? For every antibiotic that's approved by the FDA or EMA, um, you know, there are literally uh, you know, dozens upon dozens of projects. We, we estimated at least 30 that started to hit the lead for each one that makes it here. So I'm not showing for each one of these the 29 others that were small companies that hit the lead that failed and didn't make it this far. So these are the winners, okay? And what's happened to the winners? Well. These three are in bankruptcy or liquidation, and the rest of them had either major layoffs recently or a distressed sale. And distressed sale, by that it means that they sold the company at a price that meant that the original R&D investors lost money. The company's still alive, but the R&D investors, it's negative. This is, the, this is the market. And so R&D investors have fled the market because they also understand this slide. Which is the reason, again, why CARBEX exists. It's the reason why we also need pull incentives, which the United Kingdom is the first in the world uh, to do and to do in, in a major way. But uh, you know, the short story here is that nobody investing in antibiotics right now, it makes sense because the reimbursement system is broken. It's not just um, access in the high-income countries that's a problem, it's also, or low-income, it's also a problem of access in the high-income countries. This is a study that I published in Clinical Infectious Diseases with, with co-authors a couple of years ago. And um, you know, being at the top of this slide is not the place you want to be, right? So uh, 18 uh, antibiotics approved by, by these regulatory authorities over this period of time. 17 are available in the United States. Um, 14 of those were approved by EMA, and then you can see, even though it's approved, so, so think about Denmark, it's approved in EMA, there's not an additional regulatory approval, but the company still did not commercially launch it in Denmark, or even half of them in Germany, right? Why? It's because the reimbursement is so low, the company cannot make enough money, uh, to e even though they have regulatory approval to launch it in these countries. Um, Switzerland uh, was added later to, to this chart. Obviously, they're, they're not part of, of EMA, but uh, they wanted to know how they came out and, and was not happy. Um, I'm told that, uh, that you know, the, the Canadian government, that this was part of a, of a letter from the, uh, you know, each year the, the prime minister writes a letter to the health minister and says, you know, to each member of the cabinet, it says fix various things. It's a directive letter. And, and this stirred action in, in multiple countries because, um, the access is not there even in a high-income country, even in, in places in Europe, okay? Now, if this is true in high-income countries, what is the story in the rest of the world? Well, you, you can imagine it's worse. It's no better than Canada, okay? So, so the fruit of innovation is not getting to the people. And so it makes you wonder, well, what is the purpose of the innovation? And the last thing about, about um, in this economics piece, I know it's pretty dismal, right? It lives up to its reputation. But is uh, the, the researchers, and this is researchers from, from uh, in, the, in the purple sort of slide, 
Uh, I think it was seven companies, and many of the same companies I showed in the previous slide, and they looked at them through their first job change after the company went through layoffs and, and whatnot, and, and most of them went to something else in the light blue, a few of them stayed in antibiotics and purple, and then their second job change, even fewer of them uh, were in antibiotics. And then a, a slightly larger data set, the, the little red, blue, and, and yellow stick figures, which is a work from, from my group, and uh, tracking over eight years what happened from June, we took a snapshot of everybody working in antibiotic R&D from a, um, a PhD, MD, or Master of Science, more than half time in antibiotic R&D at nine different firms um, as of June of 2018, and then found out what they were doing five years later to the day, right? Most of them have left antibiotics. Uh, a number, some of them are state, and then the, the two yellow figures are people working in nonprofits. Most of those are either working for Carvex or for GARP. Right? This is a problem because the ability to continue the human capital, have people that are able to carry on these functions is important and we're bleeding out that. Again, it goes back to that slide, $150 billion goes missing. It has an impact. The companies die, the research stream dies. We're at a tipping point, I think. Third topic, antibiotics to public infrastructure. This is my street in some rural Massachusetts. They're digging it up. Uh, I just got a notice they're gonna come back and dig things up more, uh, but I'm not mad. I'm not, because they have a plan. And you know, my house is 120 years old, the water pipes are 120 years old in the street. They had a 100 year useful life, it was time to replace them. And I'm grateful they're replacing them, right? In, in American cities in which they fail to replace the water pipes, you know, the, it becomes a tragedy, Flint, Michigan, right? Uh, or, you know, or Detroit, you know, you know, cities in which there's a problem, we find out about it. But uh, the people who do this are not randomly digging up streets, they have long-term plans, they know where the oldest pipes are. Um, they don't have to run a bake sale to try to, to, to fund this. They have long-term debt, they have bonds, they, they work it out. And, and they have professionals who are in charge. Okay. Antibiotics, most important drug class in human history. Who's in charge? You know, where's the funding that's long-term, that has that sort of vision? Who's thinking about, well, look, there's these five antibiotics that are really useful for global health. At Center for Global Development, we had a paper we called these workhorse drugs. What are the generic antibiotics, many of them oral, that are carrying most of the work in, in, the, in the low and middle income countries today and saving lives? Is anyone thinking about when they might run out because of resistance? Is anyone working to replace them? The answer is no. Almost nobody is thinking about this. So nobody in charge, the pipes are getting older, they're starting to rust, they're starting to leak. We're heading for a Flint, Michigan sort of situation, but on a global scale. And so we needed to change the way we pay for antibiotics. Let's pay for social value. Let's pay for access, not use. Let's pay for the insurance value. And uh, there's a lot that's been written on this, including excellent work at the, at the National Health Service um, on, on what we call steady values, but the social values of antibiotics. Finally, equity. So, you know, we can save lives today through targeted access. We could save 7.7 .7 million died and 1.27 million of those with resistant infection. Uh, so the balance we could save through targeted access now. Let's do a massive access outreach project that could save millions of lives now with drugs we have today. But if you're familiar with the Mortar trial, which, uh, you know, I, were they a Tolkien fan who named the, you know, the, uh, Mordor? Uh, and I know it works better in French, but, um, you know, the, the mass dosing of azithromycin, uh, based on, on what they learned, uh, you know, as an incidental finding from trachoma studies, um, actually has, through several follow-on studies, a significant mortality benefit, especially for children under five, especially in the poorest settings, especially when done at a community level, as opposed to a household level, okay? But when you read the editorials, you know, they raise this question, well, gosh, won't this also create resistance to macrolides? And, and my point is, did you see the mortality benefit? You know, why, why are we worrying about the future loss of effective macrolides when it could save lives today? How do we make that trade off? And, and I'm, I'm not saying I know how to make the, this is the ethical question that should be asked and evaluated. How do we do this sort of trade off? But it's not just between people alive now, it's also intergenerationally. If these antibiotics are actually things that are derived from soil, uh, microorganisms that evolved over uh, you know, multiple hundreds of millions of years, uh, maybe most of what we have today is derived from that platform. You can think of that maybe as a, as a, as a finite resource. 
And, and we've burned through that in about 100 years, right? So, so maybe there's an intergenerational ethical uh, component here that we can think about. And also just in general, I think all equitable frameworks in this area probably prefer prevention. I've never seen anyone write about this. It's just a speculation on my part. But um, I think it should prefer prevention because prevention at least doesn't have that negative externality. You eliminate that. If, if the best bacterial infection is the one that never happened. So equity, a lot of work that could be done there. So thinking about solutions, there's three things that have to happen together. You have to have access, innovation, and stewardship simultaneously. You can't have one without the other. If you do one without the other two, you actually undermine the other two. If you do two out of three, it's actually undermining. You need a solution that actually does all of these things effectively together. One example of that work, which is you know being branded as the grand bargain of the Center for Global Development, this, this paper, I'm, I'm a a uh, co-collaborator on, is to, is to focus on the, on the G7, high-income countries paying for the innovation, uh, you know, a larger group of countries focusing on access and every country focusing on, on stewardship in order to try to address this problem simultaneously. And in the reimbursement space, uh, pull incentives or the, or the UK subscription model are examples of ways to simultaneously solve uh, these three problems. I think I'm going to go on. Say a little bit about CARBEX. CARBEX is a push incentive. Uh, lots of reports uh, saying how important it is to fund early stage research. Uh, there's, a, there's a dearth in the pipeline, especially in the advanced clinical stages. The, the preclinical stages where we work, there's been a lot of tremendous science coming out of universities that we've supported. We've supported our 100th project uh, recently. And, uh, and so there's a healthy pipeline coming. But uh, you know, without this healthy early stage pipeline supported by, by CARBEX and others, you're not going to have a late stage pipeline that anything like a pull incentive could address. Think about how many things and how much money is required. You know, if you want six high impact antibiotics per decade, just, just pretend that that's the target. Six really good ones per decade, not per year. What does that require? Well, it actually requires 6,000 basic research projects probably 20 years ago. And uh, 215 uh, hit to lead projects more than a decade ago. Carbex space is the red space in the middle from hit to lead uh, to the end of phase one. And you can see the dollar amounts uh, on the left on, on what's required. Well, how do, how do those dollar amounts compare to, to what we're actually spending? Well, just for the red, you know, for the sake of time, um, there's a significant gap. We've totaled up the, the global AMR R&D hub in Berlin has looked at all the sources for this stage and, and have totaled up all the money that they can find. And it's 1.9 billion being spent instead of the 5.6 billion that, that's currently being spent. So we're $370 million short per year, which is a pittance compared to the 13 billion a year that's been sucked out of the R&D market. But it's a lot more money that's required in order to move forward even six new antibacterials per decade. And uh, lots of major reports funded by governments that come to this conclusion. We're trying to get the governments to actually act on it, but at least the, the reports are, are clear on their consensus. Uh, CARBEX does this work with 30 some odd active projects, 100 of them have been funded. The thing I'm most uh, proud of here is the 14 first in humans uh, for therapeutics and for, and for prevention. Everything that we do at CARBEX has a stewardship and access commitment. The same contractual commitment was signed by GSK as by the smallest company or the university research group. We have contractual language which follows them to the end of the patent, which makes them commit to goal stewardship and access. With, the, uh, with, the, with carrots, but also you know, a stick, and the stick is in the hands of the director of Wellcome Trust. Think about solutions in my last minute, or three minutes, okay. Um, this is work in which I've estimated how big of a pull incentive a subscription model would be required. It's a $310 million uh, per drug per year, 3.1 billion globally, mainly paid out of high income countries. It's in health affairs, you can go read it there. But then, uh, interesting, I, I've tried to break that up within high-income countries, so uh, what is the fair share? Uh, if we're gonna do subscription models in, in the G7, what does each country have to come forward with, right? And you see, uh, you know, the UK portion here is, is 19 million US dollars. Well, the original amount of the UK subscription program was a little low. Uh, the re revised amount after the consultation is gonna be, you know, actually above that range, which is outstanding. You can see uh, Europe is, is thinking about a pull incentive and you know, here's the target uh, for them if we're all gonna do this together in a way that's sufficient, uh, but also fair based on, on G GDP. 
And I've included Australia, South Korea, and Switzerland there as well, mainly because those countries, even though not in the G7 or EU27, uh, have substantial research innovation structures and could support it. There's a lot of things going on at the G7. There's a UN high-level meeting in September. How many of you are involved at all in the, in the UNGA uh, high-level meeting on antimicrobial resistance? You know, the United Nations is actually talking about this issue this September. All the work, of course, will be done now and, and has already been done or will be completed by the World Health Assembly in May. There will be a follow-on ministerial in Saudi Arabia, and the World Economic Forum is doing, you know, something in January as well. So this is my last slide, thinking about civilization facing a test. Now, maybe climate change is one test. Climate change is a harder issue. It's going to cost more money. It's going to require more behavior change. And there's entire industries who hate the idea of, of, of the, want to try to undermine the science. None of that is true for antibiotics. It's actually a relatively inexpensive fix. There's a lot of consensus. And, the, and there's not a pro-bacteria lobby that I've found so far. <laughs> okay. But we have to move beyond individuals. We have to think ecologically complex thoughts. We need solutions that are socially embedded. And, and we have to actually work together as scientists. So some of you in this room may have spent your entire career on, on one species or one family of species. You know, you're a Kleb person or a tuberculosis person. You know, we are grateful, the world is grateful that somebody was studying uh, filioviruses for years before Ebola and that somebody was, was working on bat coronaviruses. I mean, your parents probably were horrified. You know, what is the future of somebody studying bat viruses, right? The world is grateful now, right, for such a thing. Um, but it requires that, that we move out of whatever the, the one thing we do is and, and think more broadly about not just the bench science but the ecological impact and the social and legal ecologies of, uh, of all of that so that what you're doing in the, in the bat, in the bench, in the lab actually makes it to a patient at the end of the day. So thank you for your patience. I hope now you see why a lawyer was allowed to speak at a genomics <laughs> conference. But if not, I'll go quietly. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin, for that fantastic talk. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Questions from people here and online. And we have uh, microphones throughout. Um, thanks for an amazing talk. That was wonderful. Um, I, you've finished on a really positive note saying that this particular solution that you're talking about is relatively cheap. But that's just about fixing the pipeline problem to create new antibiotics. Whereas at the beginning you told us all of the other things that we need to fix as well. So do you have any comments about the mechanisms and costs of fixing all the other stuff? <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> yes, I mean, the, the OECD put out an excellent report a few years ago called A Few Dollars More. It sounds like a Western movie starring Clint Eastwood, <laughs> but it's a slightly different name. And uh, it's really all about, with a, a couple billion dollars investment in, in WASH and, and prevention, what an amazing return on investment that would be, okay? So uh, when, when I say it's relatively cheap, you know, 10 to 15 billion dollars globally per year, makes a tremendous impact on everything, not just pipeline, but, but the entire panoply of what's going on, which uh, compared to what we need to spend on climate change is, is very inexpensive. And compared to the social value of preserving this drug class is amazing value. So I didn't show the, the data for these other things, but I do take the broadest possible view on what we should be investing in. Yeah. Excellent talk. Uh, Amy Mathers, University of Virginia. Um, I was just. I've just been thinking a lot about, so we're doing all this surveillance, we're getting surveillance into other countries where it's needed probably the most to understand what the problems are. But how do you think about that gap where, you know, a lot of the drug development that you've highlighted that's really, really important, combating genes of drug resistance, say with a cajun or, you know, but, you know, emerging salmonella typhi that's resistant to pretty much every drug you throw at it. And the, where that's emerging, and we find out about it, but nobody, there's even worse of a market for salmonella typhi and how you even design those trials and how you even think about that. So how are you guys sort of thinking about those big gaps of where the problem may be the worst 
and there's even a larger gap between even startups and, and all of that. This is so much easier in drug development for non-communicable diseases because they, they, they know how many people are dying from you know, lung cancer or something and, and can project what other therapies or, or behavioral changes will do to that number, but they, they have an idea what their market will be. Uh, for us, it's, you know, for communicable diseases, it's just harder, isn't it? But um, the short answer to you is that, is that not only do all of us in this room need that surveillance data now to, to influence treatment and, and care and prevention, but uh, CarbEx and the companies we're working with need, needed it 15 years ago. <laughs> you know, in other words, we're developing things now that are 10 years away from the market and 15 years away from global rollout. Right? So, so we need good tools from folks here to tell us accurately what the world will look like, because we need to be preparing drugs for that state, which is unknown at present. Um, stay tuned for our next session, um, measuring the burden of AMR. Question. All the way in the back. Yeah. Thanks so much. That was an epic talk. The uh, difference between uh, community understanding or, or need or demand for cancer drugs versus uh, anti antibiotics, is there, has there been any psychological uh, studies done as to why there's such a huge demand for, for that area versus antibiotics? It's way beyond my field. I know that Wellcome has, has funded some work in, in the past five years on, on how to better communicate these concepts to the, to the general public. Right, but um, I'm personally not aware of work that that describes why patients care so much about uh, you know don't mind paying lots of money for the cancer drugs and we'll petition the governments when when this is not true. Part of it, you know, Dame Sally would Dame Sally Davies would say, Master Trinity, um, that uh, it's because nobody understands that that their uncle died from from drug resistant bacteria. You know, they 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 died from pneumonia, right? But uh, you know, or sepsis, right? And, and but the the sequence evolved based on a on a bloodstream infection of a bacterial origin. So uh, there's a there's a lot of work that needs to be done there, and but I'm not the person to. You know, maybe there's somebody else in this room, but uh, you know, that's an example of an entire field of which I'm almost entirely ignorant. Well. Take our next question from one of our virtual attendees. Or we could end with my ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> I think, is, oh, oh, come on, well done, Lewis. Yeah, yes. uh, we've got a question from Aruka Keki, uh, who's joined us online. Uh, it is really hard to get investment in antimicrobial development, but probably even harder for WASH, which could provide the prevention you mentioned is necessary. How should we be advocating and paying for WASH? Yeah, I mean, WASH obviously has to be paid for as a public good. You know, it, it needs charitable and government funding uh, to, 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 make, to make that done, because it's hard to make that a market good. Um, you know, wash and sanitation in those settings it requires massive in investment by charitable and government settings. For uh, for for antibacterials in general, you know, the despite all the mobilization that we've done and other people have done, you know, the data that we've presented, the data that in the Swedish report uh, for the uh, for their presidency of the European Council, was that we're only funding about a third of what we need, right? So uh, so it's a poverty all around, uh, <laughs> except for the basic sciences. Which uh, you know do have some robust you know legislators understand the need for basic science, but uh, translating that to actual patients has been more difficult. Question. Thank you so much, Tamsin Dewey, Veterinary Medicines Directorate. I really liked your three-legged stool, um, and I just wondered if you could elaborate a bit more on stewardship because we see stewardship as being the responsibility of primarily clinicians, whether that's working in animal health or working in human health. Um, but you seem to be implying that st the responsibility for stewardship is on the pharmaceutical companies. And I just wondered if you could just go into a bit more detail. I think the yeah. pharmaceutical companies have a role to play. And the companies themselves, through their AMR Industry Alliance, have acknowledged that role. And, and at Carbex, we place a stewardship obligation on the companies. So for example, um, it's, it's inappropriate for the company to give a volume-based uh, bonus to sales individuals uh, for upping the, the volume of units of sale of the antibiotics. And that might work for many other drug classes. It should not be the case. And the industry has embraced changing how they pay internally 
their sales forces for antibacterials. So that's an example of that. But more generally, you know, I, I put the stool up there. I could actually, that represented like two years of my life. You know, I could talk about that. There's a lot of nuance there. If you had perfect stewardship, the right drug to the right patient at the right time, the right dose, stewardship and access then are the same thing, right? But in our imperfect world, you know, filled with people like us, humans, uh, stewardship and access exhibit themselves differently. And, and that's the point there. So perfect stewardship is not in opposition to perfect access or innovation. It's just in the way that it's socially embedded is why you see these things at, at tension with each other. Uh, I think we have one last question up there, and then we'll end the session. Thank you. Um, Constance Schultz, Amsterdam. Um, you mentioned UNGA uh, 20, in uh, September. Um, there are quite a few structures, like the Global Leaders Group and so on, uh, all over, I would say. Are you, would, should we argue all together for a structure like the IPCC or, or the Global Fund, or better, both combined, um, to ensure that we do have that uh, common good uh, taken care of? Yeah, so um, I, I blew right past it, but um, a very important thing that's on the table for the United Nations General Assembly in September is the Independent Panel on Evidence for Action on AMR. This is the analog to what they have in climate science on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC. And, and the goal here would be to, to figure out, look at the data, and to identify gaps. Because today, we can't really answer questions like, how much should we be spending on WASH versus the pipeline versus something else, versus vaccines. You know? It's difficult to answer that. Or you know, if we spent several billion in reducing agricultural use, what would the payoff be to human health? We don't really know the exact payoff. And so the, the goal of this panel would be to, to advance the science of integrating all of these disparate areas uh, and uh, be able to build something closer to a model. You know, the climate models in the 70s were very simplistic. Today they're very complex and filled with data. We're like in the 1950s <laughs> or something in terms of having a, a planetary model on antimicrobial resistance. And uh, it's my opinion that the independent panel would, would greatly advance that or has the potential to advance that. I'm a big supporter of it. Uh, I'm sorry I jumped over it and thank you for, for calling it out. Okay, well, let's thank Kevin again for laying out both a sobering uh, vision of our current situation, but also a hopeful view towards the change that we can try to bring about. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you.